We have today a wonderful leader that came directly to Washington, D.C. for this afternoon with us. And he's been just about all, all over the world doing things, international causes, and, uh, and always working for, for, for peace and encouraging the 160 chapters now in the United States, 160 chapters of UNA USA. So without further delay, let me introduce to you our CEO, CEO of UNA from Washington, D.C., Chris Watley. Thank you, Pablo, and thank you for the, to the whole UNA San Francisco leadership team and the fantastic group of speakers that we've had before us, state and local leadership, ROTC cadets. Uh, Pablo mentioned that we have 160 chapters across the country. That means that this weekend and tomorrow, in 160 places across the United States, this same thing is happening in Birmingham, Alabama, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, in Hilo, uh, Hilo, Hawaii. You're having Americans who, for some reason, see something in the UN's mission and work that connects to something in themselves. And I find that to be a fantastic thing. And really, all I'm here to do is to talk very briefly about elections and hope. And those are two words that haven't been traveling much together lately, I have to say. And that's because I'm talking about another election the election of the new UN Secretary General, that election that might not be as much on the headlines or in the mind share of all of us here in the United States, but one which I do view very much as a great hopeful global development. So just two weeks ago, a little bit more than that, but about two weeks ago, our ambassador to the United Nations, who, who joined us at a ba major event in New York that I just came from, uh, she stood in front of this, uh, with, with all of her colleagues from the, uh, the Security Council, with her Russian counterpart. The Russians are the president of the, the Security Council for the month of October, and unanimously chose Antonio, Antonio Gutierrez to be our next Secretary General. Now, why I find that so hopeful in this moment is we've laid out this crisis. We've laid out that huge number of 65 million refugees and inter internally displaced people in the world. Huge number to wrap your head around, but a huge opportunity for action. And why I view it as a hopeful thing is, how many times do you see the United States and Russia standing in unison to make a major global announcement like that? Not much right now. Great moment just to see that, to see the consensus that came with, with them. But I have to say that that consensus isn't universal, perhaps, about this Secretary General. And, and Samantha Power spoke to us two nights ago just about her own feelings on the process that led to this next Secretary General. You know, for those of you who are deeply passionate about the UN, like our San Francisco leaders, we've been, we've been looking at this process for a year now, the selection of the next Secretary General, and we've been focused on it because it's so freight with meaning in that this is the first time in the history of the world that the election of a new president and the election of a Secretary General are happening at the exact same moment. And the relationship of those two leaders are gonna have huge global implications. And the, the world system was very much focused on electing a woman as Secretary General, also a focus on an Eastern European because of the strange regional rotation system that we have in the UN. So all of this focus on surely in this globe, can't we find a woman, a, a statesperson, a, a leader from the international system who could step up and take this international institution to the place that it needs to be to address the crises before us. And Samantha Power spoke about that. And she spoke about the fact that there are 193 UN member states, but only 37 of the ambassadors to the UN system are women. She's one of 37 women who sit there in the General Assembly. And she spoke about the expectations that come with that, and also the unfair questions often in the hearings that led to the, the selection of the Secretary General that were po posed to women candidates, the, the expectations uh, that, that they should be accountable for certain aspects of their background that no male candidate would be. But then she ultimately said that, first of all, this was the most transparent process that the UN has ever gone through in selecting a secretary general, a process that was normally in the private room off of the side of the Security Council where most business is done. Open hearings over the course of a year 
in which all of these candidates laid out their credentials and ultimately from her perspective, recognizing the challenges, recognizing her own personal disappointment that there aren't more women in leadership in the UN that she viewed Antonio Guterres as by far the best person for this moment in history. In part because of this same crisis we've just been touching upon. That challenge of welcoming the stranger, as the Imam said, of wrapping our heads around this refugee crisis, and as, as the rabbi said, seeing ourselves our own backgrounds within it. You know, 65 million, that's a big number, but numbers like that don't matter anymore unless you can see yourself in it. And one of the numbers within that number that, that speaks to me the most, which also speaks to the point the Imam made, is who are those refugees? Over 50% are children. Over 80% are women and children. These are families fleeing immediate threats. That's the crisis. It's a crisis of children, a crisis of families fleeing war. And what's been the driver of it? Yes, war has been the currency of this crisis. Old wars that don't end and new wars that start. 15 conflicts have begun over the last six years. Sure, there's Syria, there's Yemen, but there's also South Sudan, there's the Central African Republic, there's parts of Burma and the Rohingya refugee population. There is a host of new conflicts, and the old ones in Iraq or Afghanistan or Somalia just don't end. And you get that crisis as a result. Now, within that crisis, and because it's about children, because it's about families, we have to, once again, unpack what is some aspect of the global response that we can perhaps focus even more attention on. And for me, to me, it's, it's the crisis of education within that crisis. If this is a crisis of children, if, as the Imam said, we're, we're increasingly focused on refugees who stay refugees for decades, sometimes a lifetime, then we need to invest in more than just basic shelter and sustenance. We need to provide pathways of hope through education. And right now, even though over half the global refugee population are under the age of 18, Less than half of them have access to even primary education. There is a crisis in delivering basic education access to refugees. And it's one that we can do something about. We can focus our advocacy, we can focus our resources, we can address this aspect of the crisis. And even with that, in that, I would say that the aspect of that challenge that concerns me the most, motivates me the most, makes me most uh, passionate to get up in the morning and do what we have to do as UNA USA. It's 3.7 million children who are in UNHCR refugee camps who are school age and don't have access to education. So there are about 6 million kids who are in, a, in an actual camp setting. Because when we talk about refugees, we're talking about just communities in Turkey and in Jordan and people on, 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 uh, in, in communities across the world. We're not always talking about camps. But in this case, you have the infrastructure in place, you have schools, you have teachers, but the, but the UN system, the UN Refugee Agency, just simply doesn't have the resources to add additional capacity to schools to ensure that at least half of the six million kids in their care can get primary education. And a kid without access to education is a child adrift. They're, they're subject to, victim, to being victims of human trafficking, you know, an, an issue that, that our law enforcement co colleagues fight bravely here in San Francisco. It's a global issue with local dimensions. If you don't have children with basic access to ed education, basic uh, opportunities for the future, then you are, you, you are subject to be radicalized, you are subject to being trafficked. We've got to address that. We can't afford to have a lost generation. And I would say that that is one of the primary focuses of our advocacy as UNA USA. We put about 300 people on the Hill in June to advocate for this very thing. We hope to do even more next June. It's a bipartisan issue that there are aspects of the refugee challenge that, of course, they touch upon partisan issues. And we don't have to talk about those. But ultimately, ensuring that a kid has access to, to basic education in Jordan or Turkey or in the Kakuma camp or Dadaab camp in Kenya that's a bipartisan issue. We can mobilize for that. We can address that. But we can also do more ourselves through our philanthropy, through our local action. The UN system estimates that just to accommodate the new kids coming into the system, because it's about 600,000 new kids that are added to that 6 million every year, and that's, and that's just since 2014, it's getting even higher and higher. They need to add 12,000 classrooms 
to their existing infrastructure base in these UNHCR-supported schools, in camp settings and others, in, uh, across the, the nine major priority um, countries, priority crises they're, wor they're working on. That's something that we as UNAUSA, this day, this weekend, are trying to put our own philanthropy, philanthropy behind. We've got 50 chapters, 50 communities across the country who are raising funds to build a single classroom. We can't build 12,000, but an, an individual community can. All the chapters here in the, the Greater Bay Area are doing the same thing. I'm gonna leave here, go over across the Bay Bridge, and we're gonna host a fundraiser for it. There are things that we can do to personalize this crisis. We can't fix everything, but we can put our advocacy behind it. We can pick targets that have a, a disproportional impact, like education access, and we can put our own personal philanthropy behind it. But I would say beyond that, probably the most important thing we can all do is what you've already accomplished here. Just raising awareness for it. The challenge about addressing the refugee crisis is mobilizing resources, mobilizing advocacy, but mobilizing ourselves to see the strangers in our midst. And we've done that in this forum. We'll do that in 160 others. And I'm very grateful for everyone being here today.